Welcome to Free Play. Today we're looking at 1944 The Loop Master. It would be an indignity to both the shmups and arcade games to speak of them without at least mentioning 1942 by Capcom. Not only did it inform a genre for years to come, but it was also one of those few games that catapulted Capcom into the limelight while arcades were in their prime. So when Capcom brought back the series for 1944 The Loop Master in 2000, did it handle well, or did it have a high altitude flameout? By the time that 1944 was released, the genre had gone through some substantial changes. The original game and the sequels thereafter didn't have things like minuscule hitboxes, and there was very little that the player could do to mitigate damage aside from dodge like crazy. It was, needless to say, a simpler time. 1944 follows this idea as well, which sets it apart from the other shmups at the time, which relied a lot on gimmicks like knowing where the hitbox was, or how best to absorb and reflect shots. These gimmicks are by no means bad or unnecessary, but for the time to go back to the same style as used by the 1984 classic was a severe departure from what arcades were at the time. Developer Aiding Games was responsible for a number of works such as Armed Police Batrider and Battle Garega, both are fine shooters in their own right, but where this company gets the most work is with licensed games and working with other major companies. It is most recently responsible for Tatsunoko vs. and Marvel vs. Capcom, as well as Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate. So with that kind of pedigree, it's unsurprising that the game plays so well. The main draw of this game is the graphics, which are pretty stellar for the CPS 2, which came out in 1993. The CPS 2, or Capcom Play System 2, was the workhorse on which most of the best games came out for the arcade in the 90s. Not to say that every game on that was a gem, but it performed admirably until 2001 when it was finally replaced by the CPS-3. So you play as the pilot of either a P-38 Lightning or a Mitsubishi 6AM-0 against the entirety of the Japanese army. Why a Japanese Zero is running sorties against its own manufacturers, anyone's guess. And as a matter of fact, I seriously doubt that in the history of aviation there's been this many warplanes in the air. But by the same token, the game also involves fighting battleships with their own zip code, so what do I know? You get limited power-ups that only increase the number of bullets fired, but you do have a life bar, which is a much bigger departure than you might think for this style of game. Likewise, the addition of wingmen, while nothing new, are also able to be used as bombs in a pinch. The regular bomb is actually a flight of Tomahawk missiles, which, while cool visually, wouldn't be made until the 1970s by the United States. Likewise, some of the other weapons featured seem a bit too high-tech for... <laughs> oh right, level 8, your wingmen get lasers. How could I forget? LASERS! So this game isn't really all that concerned with historical accuracy. The planes are also able to do a charge shot move after holding down the fire button, but the problem is that doing so keeps everything else from firing. Likewise, the damage output doesn't seem to be that much more impressive than just bouncing around firing wildly. So your enemies are everything but the kitchen sink, and even then I'm not entirely sure. You fight battleships, massive jet fighters, super tanks, and extra mega super battleships, jets, and extra mega super tanks. It's like a Pokemon Evolution string in here. For 15 levels. You'd think after sinking the third high mobile battleship, they'd just pack it in. Like, oh man, they shot down both of our super secret fighters. Give up! The bosses, by the way, have the good sense to bug out if you don't kill them fast enough. But sadly, there's no timer to tell you when they might do such a thing. So while it's a nice touch, it's also kind of frustrating, because you can be right in the middle of a fight and he can just leave. When all is said and done, does it get the free play quarter of approval or the slug of shame? The game looks and plays great, the whole, the whole thing has just enough silliness to it, and it's just challenging enough to entertain without frustrating. On the downside, you will suffer pretty significant fatigue after blasting through 15 levels, and watching that one get away will haunt you for the rest of your days. But playing it to the end is a task few will probably undertake, so it looks like this one gets a quarter of approval. <coughs> Join us next time when we look at SNK's Prehistoric Isle in 1930. If you like what you saw, Consider donating to my Patreon to get early access to all the new vids as they come out. And as always, 
Thanks for watching.